Zinsky. Joining us now, the editor of Commentary, John Pedoritz. John posted a piece on Commentary yesterday entitled, Why Even Now We Are Commanded to Laugh, which was adapted from the speech he gave at his son Isaac's bar mitzvah this past Saturday. In it, he talked about the challenges the Jewish community is facing, but why, as a whole, the community needs to find the light. Take a listen to part of John's speech. The first thing you need to know about Isaac is that his name was not supposed to be Isaac. It was going to be Shy. He was born 13 years ago on July 14th, and we looked at him, and we kissed him, and we called him Shy, but we kept the name to ourselves as it is tradition not to share the name until the bris. Something didn't feel right, and then the next day, Al and I looked at each other and we said, his name is Isaac, and thereafter, his name was Isaac. And the name God chose for the firstborn Jew means, well, no one has figured out exactly how to translate it, but it's either something like he who laughs or simply laughter. Think of it. The first Jew was named laughter. The fact that God promises Abraham he will make of us a great nation represents not only a reward, but as we see right now, a perpetual threat, a threat from the hostility and envy of others who would want to make us small or destroy us altogether. That's some prize we got. It's the reason Jews have told some version of this joke forever. The Jew goes up to heaven and asks God whether the Jews are the chosen people. Yes, Shmulek, God says, you are the chosen people. Well, says Shmulek, would you mind choosing someone else for the change? <laughs> laughter. Maybe we are celebrating Laughter. Laughter is not only his name, it is his guidepost, as it should be ours. These have been among the worst weeks of my life, of all of our lives, I think. But we cannot allow the evildoers to rob us of the glories of this earth, its beauties, its bounties, its joys. That is what they want from us, Isaac, what they want from us Jews. They want us to sink into despair, because that will weaken us. And their goal is to take away from us the miracle that is our state, our homeland, the refuge and the place, as Michal Kotler Wunsch told this congregation last week, that exists now in the wake of the Holocaust, because had it existed before, there would have been no Holocaust. Just as there will be no Holocaust now, because there is an Israel. Just as we will live to laugh and to celebrate and to live as Jews. John, that was beautiful. Wow. Thanks. Thank Thanks thank so you. much so for letting us share ways that. Well, beautiful. thank you. I'm, you know, I'm oh. honored and moved that you chose to share that. Well, you know, um, in darkness, in, in the darkest times, we see the light and we appreciate it so much more. And uh, it's hard to read a post uh, that, that you said, that you wrote uh, a couple days ago without tearing up. But you write this. Oh my gosh. I was in front of our synagogue. A car pulled up, two men in the front seat. One said, is this your building? I said, yes. He said, we are Egyptian Muslims. We stand with you. We are sorry for what happened to you. And we will stand with you. Thank you, I said, trying not to cry. I'm trying not to cry. So that was the night before the, the bar mitzvah where I, where I spoke. Uh, we had a Friday night dinner at the synagogue. Um, and I was waiting for my 93-year-old father to arrive in a taxi cab to help him out, to bring him to the uh, synagogue's room where we had set up the dinner. And this car pulls up and stops. And I'm immediately, right. you know, my hackles go up. Or, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm on guard. I don't know what's going to happen. And it was such a a beautiful and unexpected moment. I mean, we had, I think the world has seen also on Twitter this um, footage of this gentleman in Forest Hills, Queens, confronting somebody who was pulling down one of the, you know, makeshift handmade posters of right. the kidnapped kids. That's a much more um, graphic or uh, sort of profane, little, profane little confrontation. Right, yeah. right. But, um, but, um, 
things like that mean But Barnacle so much. Beer and yes. I, after seeing that video, said, yeah, we're in that tribe. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, got, you, got, you guys are, and, and it, is, it, is, it means so much um, that moments like that, but it means so much that if you look at American polling, you know, over 70% of Americans say that they understand that, you know, Israel was unjustly and unfairly attacked. They stand with, they support aid mm -hmm. to Israel. They also, in equal numbers, support humanitarian aid to Gaza. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the, I don't know how that works logistically, to right. be right. honest, but, but you can see the two faces right. of the United States there, meaning on the one hand, this you know unjust attack on an American ally, uh, and on the other hand, what can we do to make sure that there the horrors victims. that are going to follow this are minimized? Is what can we do? And that is you know one of the reasons that I lo I love this country so much that it can show those two faces at the same time. Yeah, um, should be able to. Yeah, well we I think we do. I mean I think we do it at real. Moments, you know, it's a classic thing about America that there's a there's an earthquake in a country that maybe fifty percent of the people in this country haven't heard of. Right. And then in twenty four hours, oceans of money are raised from right. everywhere, from churches, from s civilian groups, from you know, from whoever. And then the question is always. That's the emotion. How do you get it there? We, we, how do you yeah. make it work? How right. do you, how do you make, make sure that that, that, that largesse right. or that, that generosity actually yeah. gets to the people who needs it, which is really the question about aid to Gaza is we can raise as much humanitarian as we possibly can. How do we make how sure do, that do we Hamas doesn't take it right. and then give it to the Hamas terrorists and not to yeah. the children who need it. And, and Willie, we, um, we, we say all the time that the United States has fed and freed more people than any other country. Uh, in the history of, of of humankind, and that is the truth, and and that is something that's great about our country. I will say another thing that that all of this brings up is, I always remember this quote I read from Paul McCartney a long time ago that we talk about here too, which is, you know, they ask why are you such an optimist? He goes because you know I just look around, and I think we've got them outnumbered. Mm. Talking about you know the good guys, we got them outnumbered. That's still the truth. You, you hear that story outside the synagogue. We got them outnumbered. Yeah, I tell my kids that all the time because they've come of age in the world the last ten years, in particular, where all they see and hear about is conflict and fight domestically, and right. they see all this happening at home. I said there is much more light than dark in the world. Dark gets a lot of attention, but there is a lot more light. John, we were talking in the break about um, bar mitzvahs and the need for security at bar mitzvahs and at synagogues across the country and the way you felt when that car pulled up. And I think it's important to tell people and to tell our audience what it feels like in this moment for you and for Jews in America and around the world because never again over the generations is important, but it's sort of become a hashtag in, in some ways and it's a, a refrain, a cliche. But boy, here's the moment where never again really means something. I mean, look, there, there is a fascinating divide going on here because I walk around, obviously, New York is a very Jewish city um, in some ways. Outside of Israel, certainly the most Jewish city in the world. I'm not walking around feeling unsafe as a Jew myself. Um, but uh, if I lived in Paris, where they are now white, where they're painting uh, Stars of David on buildings owned by Jews for reasons that we do not understand. And if I were, had been living in Paris for the last 10 or 15 years, I would certainly feel extraordinarily unsafe. And I tell this story, a kid my, my daughter was in nursery school with was at Tulane, and this is what I say, there are two Americas. So there's the America of the, the guys who roll down the window in front of the building, or there is the America of the guy in Forest Hills, whatever. Then there's this elite America, and, and this, this kid that my, my daughter went to nursery school with and went through much of school with was, it was at Tulane. There was a, there was a, 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 a kind of pro-ceasefire, what I would say is a pro-Hamas demonstration going on adjacent to Tulane, not, uh, not on the campus, but on a street adjacent to the campus. Trucks were driving by carrying the Palestinian flag, 
and somebody tried to set an Israeli, standing in the bed of the truck, pickup, tried to set an Israeli flag on fire. A kid runs up with his own Israeli flag, doesn't have anything else, waving it at the Israeli flag the guy's trying to set on fire to stop that. Somebody with, a, with the flagpole either hits him or moves the flagpole toward him. And then this classmate of my daughter's runs up to help his friend and some protester with a megaphone smashes it in his face, breaks his nose, blood is gushing, he's sent to the hospital. That's a college campus. The worst images that we are seeing aren't, you know, the things that people, you know, like regular Joe anti-Semites who, you know, yahoos from the 30s right. who don't, you know, and, and Christians who hate Jews. These are like elite people in the most highly educated settings in the country who have decided to subscribe to a doctrine that seems to suggest that violence, when you have a political disagreement or you don't like the existence of a certain country, that violence against people who are either like that country, like that country, or well, want to support let, let's it, is justified. Jews. Jews. It's well, Jews. In this case, and then, violence then, against right. Jews. Right. So, mm -hmm. so this, you know, I just saw this morning again on Twitter. These people, these are citizen journalists. Are there's a kid walking on the Harvard campus with a yarmulke on, and there's a protest, and these protesters surround him and won't let him walk by. He is not attempting to engage them. He is not, like, there to fight with them. He is just trying to get from point A to point B, and they decide to make some kind of a bullying example of him. Har at Harvard. Yeah. And that is not happening, like I said, it's not happening, you know, in Forest Hills, Queens. It's happening in Cambridge. It's happening in Stanford. It's happening you know, at the University of California in Santa Cruz or in, Tul or, or in New Orleans at Tulane. That's, that's a very interesting... The American people are not the, are not the villains here, you know, in that sense. Like, I'm, I don't feel unsafe in America because of the American people. I think that people have real reason to start feeling unsafe because of the American elite. That's a very weird... Factoid. I don't quite know how to. I mean, well, my, well, Mike, I've I, I've heard, and we've talked about it here, right? That, that, that I've I've heard from friends that Jewish kids uh, some days are afraid to go to class. They just disappeared after the attacks on a lot of college campuses because they're afraid that what happened at Harvard, what happened in Tulane, could happen on their campuses. And right now, the reason they are afraid is because they don't have school administrators that are making them feel safe. It's that simple. Well, the, the vagueness of the initial responses from too many prestigious mm -hmm. schools was astounding, astounding. Th this might be, John, a question that's unanswerable, but this disease and it's anti-Semitism is a disease. It, why does it linger, recede, erupt, and always the focus is on, as Joe just pointed out, Jews? Why? Well, it's the oldest, it's, you know, for my, for my people, it's the oldest of all questions, and it, it, it lingers, you know, at, at Passover time, uh, we say this, it's not a prayer, it's a sort of thing that's said during the Passover Seder. In every generation, they rise up against us to kill us, and the Lord our God, he stays their hand. If you go through time, so here we are in America, America's not the problem here. What happened is the problem in Gaza. But you have Gaza, you have, you know, multiple incidents uh, over, over time, you have... The Holocaust, obviously, you have the expulsion from Spain, you have the Babylonian exile. Like it is a it is a feature of civilization that uh, that Jews become targets, and they often and this is sort of the reason for Zionism and why Israel exists. Uh, they become targets when they appear weak. Not when they appear strong. You would think, okay, you've got to go get that guy because he's going to come take my land or he's going to do X, Y, or Z. Jews are always most at risk when they seem most vulnerable. That's why in the wake of 
October 7th and this massacre, uh, anti-Semitic incidents have spiraled here and like all over the world because Jews look vulnerable. So it's like a kind of motive means an opportunity moment. Um, they look weak and therefore it's a free shot. Um, and that when Jews look strong or they look powerful or they look uh, self con whatever it is, uh, we seem to be less at risk. And that's part of what, Willie, when you asked about synagogues and what it's like at a synagogue, for example, since for five years, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue was attacked in Pittsburgh five years ago. And um, synagogues have been hardening themselves. And just like every office building in America, you know, like coming here, you have to go through security right. and go through a whole thing. And that's 20 years since 9-11, all that. So on the one hand, you think, OK, well, so that's life. And, you know, my kid's day school has a very elaborate security system, a Jewish day school. Um, but these are houses of worship, right? The whole idea of a house of worship is that its door is open, right? That's that is. Church door is not supposed to be locked. A synagogue door is not supposed to be locked. You are not supposed to look at somebody entering a house of worship as though they are somebody you need to secure yourself right. against. And I would say, not just for Jews, but for all, there is something deeply morally disruptive about yeah. the idea that you don't feel safe in your spiritual, moral, religious sanctuary you need to preserve your safety. But you do. It's just a fact now. So you do what you have to do. Editor of Commentary, John Padoritz, thank you. What a, an important but also so, such a special conversation. Thank you very thank you, much. Thank you, Mika. Thank on. you, guys. Thanks,